So I am continually inspired by the work that our faculty, students at Stanford University, and the partners that we work with are doing to address and to solve the grand sustainability challenges that we face today. So even though we just gave them applause, I would really like you to join me in giving yet another round of applause to Paul Rogers and that last panel. So our second panel is going to focus on next generation environmental solutions, looking even further into the future as to how we can actually address some of the major challenges that we face today. And thankfully, to moderate this second panel, we have one of the true leaders in developing and promoting those next generation environmental solutions, and that is Pamela Matson. Pam is not only a dear friend, but has really been responsible at Stanford for pushing forward our work in the area of sustainability. As probably virtually all of you know, Pam is the Chester Naramore Dean of the School of Earth Sciences and also the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Professor of Environmental Sciences. And again, we're very pleased to have her moderate the next panel. Thank you, Buzz. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all for being here. I, this is a great celebration. You know, as, as, as Jeff and, and Buzz said, we've worked together a lot um, with uh, faculty from all seven schools at Stanford to, uh, to push forward on an initiative on environment and sustainability. And Buzz and Jeff and I work together so often that our assistants call us PB&J. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, the, this initiative has launched a lot of really fantastic things. First and foremost, the Woods Institute for the Environment, and then the Precord Institute for Energy. Over the last 12 years, we've created a new interdisciplinary graduate program called the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. We've hired new faculty, and you've seen some of them already today. Um, and we've, you know, modified and changed and created new departments. The university has really changed in very fundamental ways. And a lot of that change is thanks to the leadership of the Woods Institute for the Environment. So again, I am really happy to be here to be part of the celebration. So we've all been working really hard focusing on the sustainability challenge. How are we going to meet our needs, the needs of people across the world, the needs of future generations, yet do it in a way that preserves and sustains the life support systems, our atmosphere and water systems, our climate, our ecosystems that provide so many goods and services for us. And our discussion today is going to be a little bit focused on that question. How do we do those things together? And what are the, the new kinds of research that need to be done? Um, we, we think of them as interdisciplinary very often, as focused on problems and, and use inspired, um, as working through, inter, um, th through partnerships and real efforts to link the knowledge of a university with the needs and the actions of decision makers around the world. Um, that's the kind of thing we've been aiming for. And I think today's panel will illustrate um, some of the ways that we've, we've changed in order to do that now. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's next. Which directions are we going to be going in the future? So, um, and we're going to be really focusing in, in particular on the Woods Institute's Water in the West program and also the Natural Capital program. So we've got five great panelists. Um, I'm just going to read you their names. We'll, you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about them as they uh, answer my first questions. But we have Rosemary Knight. She's the Harrington Professor in the School of Earth Sciences and a geophysicist. And she's a senior fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment. Melissa Rohde is a graduate student in civil and environmental engineering and has been a researcher for Water in the West. Lester Snow is the executive director of the California Water Foundation, and I'll say a bit more about him in a minute. Chantel Clark Samuels, uh, straight from Belize, she had just arrived uh, earlier today, is the uh, Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute um, Director. And Mary Ruckelshaus is a consulting professor at Stanford and the director of the, of the Natural Capital Project. So my strategy here is, is to ask them some questions to begin with. Um, and in doing so, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. And, uh, and we'll invite them to, 
to respond to those questions, to frame what they're doing, why it's different, and maybe the directions they think they're going to be going in the future. Um, we'll come back around for a few other questions that I get to ask, but I'm going to be counting on you to tee up a lot of really good questions. So get your thinking caps on as we go, and we'll leave plenty of time for, you, for your ideas and your questions. Maybe we can have a real discussion. Okay, so let me start <clears throat> with Rosemary Knight. Um, Rosemary, you're a, you're a geophysicist yes. and a professor in earth sciences, and you've, you've pretty much worked most of your career using geo, uh, creating, developing geophysical methods and approaches to um, address environmental concerns of different sorts. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, what it is, what your current research is about, the research that's been useful in water in the West, and what's different about the way you're doing work today, your research today, versus you know, what you've been doing over the rest of your career. Great question, so what's different? Well, I think I'll start by talking about what's stayed the same, and that's because for 25 years, I've been trying to figure out how to get the information we need about groundwater. The water that's hidden there below the surface, but an essential part of our fresh water supply. So unlike our surface water where you can see lake levels, you can see reservoirs going down, groundwater, how do we see what's there? And we need to know where the groundwater is. We need to know whether groundwater being pumped over there is connected to groundwater being pumped over there. We need to know how much groundwater is down there. We need to be able to monitor changing the amount of groundwater that's down there as we start pumping more and more. So I've been trying to figure this out for 25 years. And another thing that hasn't changed is for 25 years, I've been approaching it the same way. I am a geophysicist, as Pam said. And what geophysicists try to do is what medical imaging tries to do. We try to see into Earth. So the same way that medical imaging tries to see into the human body to see what's hidden there, geophysical imaging tries to see into Earth. So I've been working on geophysical methods where you put out sensors on Earth's surface or sensors above Earth's surface to see into these groundwater systems and figure out how we can image below the earth below the surface and figure out how much water is down there and monitor changes in the amount of groundwater. So that's what stayed the same. What's different is really interesting. And um, when I look back, I'd say 10 years ago or 10 to 25 years ago, I was really doing the foundational science, like really doing controlled laboratory experiments, controlled field experiments in settings where you could just study how imaging methods work. We were still trying to figure out how to do this, how to send energy down and get energy back and unravel the information that's in that returned energy to get the information we need. So I was really doing a lot of that foundational science. And then about, say, seven or eight years ago, there are all these papers in the scientific literature and. I started looking at what people were doing, and these groundwater managers were not using geophysical imaging. And so I started looking at the decision making that was going on as part of solving the problems we're facing in sustainable management of our groundwater resources. And I started going, well, why isn't everyone using geophysical methods? Why isn't everyone using these great methods that we in the scientific community know about? And I realized what had to happen was partnerships. And it's interesting, Jenna talked about the same thing. So about seven, eight years ago, I started forming partnerships. And instead of working on these controlled laboratory and field experiments, got out there and created partnerships with groundwater management managers, with groundwater districts. And instead of working on these simple lab experiments, started working on solving their problems. So thinking about how we can use geophysical, looking at the questions they were asking, and then backing up and saying, how can we acquire data? What sensors do we need to really support decision making? And around that time, so about four years ago, I started working closely with colleagues in Water in the West, where there's real interest in bringing science into decision making, supporting decision making. And through my work with Water in the West, I became not only interested in the connection to decision making, but the connection to policy. I remember one day I had a conversation with Buzz Thompson, and I said, 
I can't believe people would be thinking about policy if there wasn't a measurement to support it. And he said, I can't believe people spend their time developing new methods of measurement if there's no policy connection. So, <laughs> so now Buzz and I are working together, connecting the science to the policy. And in, in fact, we have a new project with uh, Leon Sheptitsky and uh, Janet Martinez in the law school <coughs> looking at how the kind of information we can obtain through geophysical imaging can be used to support decision making and, and in negotiation. The interesting thing is whether that information that we acquire does assist in negotiation. So long answer to a short question, but I started out <laughs> doing foundational science. I still do that. I love that. Absolutely fascinating, but have really focused more and more on the connection between the science and the decision making and now the policy. Okay, great. Thank you. So Lester Snow, you're coming at this from the almost the opposite direction in, in a sense. Lester is the director of the California Water Foundation, former California Secretary of Natural Resources, a leader in a number of different uh, state and, and uh, agencies and beyond. And so you've had a tremendous amount of experience in decision making related to resources and in particular to water resources, but to a broader range, I know. How do you um, manage to get the science into it, into a form that actually is useful to, to uh, roles such as you have right now? What are, the, what are the biggest challenges and how has it changed over time or has it changed over time? Well, uh, first thought after listening to Rosemary is I wonder if her imaging techniques can be used to look into the minds of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> to, that would be extremely that. helpful. <laughs> Note to self. Um, <laughs> A couple of ways to kind of a, a approach your question. One has been a, a lifelong issue for me, which is I, I look at a, a chain of development of, of information that you, you collect data and you get enough data that becomes information and you have enough information that becomes knowledge and knowledge guides policy decisions. Uh, the problem is you can make a policy decision without any knowledge whatsoever and not a shred <laughs> of data, and we have seen a lot of that. And so the challenge has all, always been moving knowledge effectively into the decision-making arena. And um, this may sound like an advertisement, but um, you know, there's a lot of institutions out there that do top-notch research in the United States and in the world. And I've never run across anything quite like the, the, the Woods Institute or the Water in the West program, which is structured for the purpose of taking state-of-the-art knowledge, developing knowledge, and try to move it effectively into uh, the decision-making arena. And, and it's, it's very challenging because often what you have to do is take 10 years of research that's manifest in 600 pages and in three journal publications and turn it into an infographic. <laughs> and uh, the more that we can do that, the more effective we're going to be in getting uh, the latest information developed into good sound policy decisions. Um, I mean, I'm gonna give a, one, it kind of, it might seem like a minor example of where, in this case, the uh, uh, Water in the West program has played a critical role on groundwater. And then maybe make a comment about some of the stuff that, that Rosemary brought up. But uh, people in the room may be aware that um, California, uh, belatedly, but nonetheless, this year finally passed groundwater legislation. And um, th there's a, a, a lot of things that came to bear on that, but one of them was over, over two years ago, I think it was May of 2012, the Water in the West program um, sponsored an uncommon dialogue. And it had practitioners in the room, it had researchers from other universities and a, a good three or four hour discussion. But one of the things that came up in that was an observation. Every time California's tried to do groundwater legislation, it's been a one-off of some sort. Thought of at the last minute and a one-off. We should have public access to well log information, which of course we should, but that's failed several times. And so the conclusion of that effort was we need a campaign. We can't just run a bill and expect it to pass. We need a campaign that has a lot of elements about it. And some of those elements are grabbing the most recent information and boiling it down so that politicians can understand uh, what's going on with groundwater because out of sight, out of mind. 
And essentially coming from that reality or realization that if we're ever going to be effective in managing groundwater, we need to start today, and that was in May of 2012, to design a campaign to methodically bring information in and be ready when there's an opportunity, like a drought, to get people's attention. But um, I, I guess what I would indicate, we're not, we're not done on the issue of groundwater. We need to pull more information in to make sure that as people start implementing programs, they're effective programs. It means metrics and monitoring. It means giving technical assistance to people that have just run pumps and really didn't understand what's happening uh, underneath the ground. And again, I would, I would close by saying, the more that we could see into the minds of politicians, the better off we would be. So could you get on that right yeah. away? <laughs> well, in a little while, I'm going to come back around to this, um, this issue of Proposition 1 and what, what is going to really be needed. Where, where are we going in this, and how can universities and, and science and technology and universities help? But, but while we're on water in the West, I do want to um, ask Melissa Rohde, who is a graduate student in civil and environmental engineering, uh, about your experience as a researcher with water in the West, I think you've been you've done some deep dives into California groundwater. Is that what, what's the experience been like, and how does it differ from other uh, graduate student experiences? I guess. Um, so I came to Stanford um, to pursue my graduate studies um, after doing academic research um, in the basic sciences, and. Basically, my research interests were in how to how can we deal with the impacts of climate change? And it wasn't really until I was involved in a glaciological research expedition in Alaska when I was standing on 4,000 meters of a melting glacier that it really dawned on me like, wow, this is a really big problem and our water cycles being completely changed rapidly. And so that experience really um, motivated me to pursue a degree in water policy and management at Oxford and also a degree here in environmental engineering at, um, at Stanford. And I, I wanted to do that because I wanted to do more applied research and really come up with better management practices for us to be able to follow. And so since coming to Stanford, for the past two years, I've been involved with Water in the West, which has been a phenomenal experience. Um, unlike a lot of other academic research that focuses more on publishing peer-reviewed journal articles, Water in the West really prioritizes um, publishing to a, in a wide array of formats. And they do this because they want their research to be seen and accessible to the public and to policymakers. And one example of this is um, the Understanding Ground California's Groundwater um, online platform that we launched on our website that translates our research on the impacts of groundwater overdraft to um, a very broad audience. And you can see that on our website. Um, additionally, a postdoc um, named Deb Perone and I have also worked on communicating some of the more details of the findings and how it relates to Proposition 1, which is the recent um, water bond that was passed last week. So overall, the, my, my experience with Water in the West has been really great because not only has it given me the opportunity to be involved with solutions-based research, but it's also helped me personally um, develop the communication skills that are really essential in communicating uh, science into policy. Great, thank you. We're going to come back to water, but I, I want to go to the Natural Capital Project for a moment, although a lot of water resource issues in that too, right? So Mary Ruckelshaus, let me ask you, you are the, um, the, the director of the Natural Capital Project, a hugely successful ongoing project that um, is a partnership between Stanford University, uh, the N Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, and, and also now the University of Minnesota and has many partners around the world. And um, you've, uh, it it's take, takes a very, very different approach to conservation and development. And can you tell us a little bit about how the Natural Capital Project works? Um, what makes it different from what has typically gone on in universities in the past and, and uh, where you think it's going? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Um, so what, what our group works on is um, based on this very basic premise, which is that 
human well-being, human health and livelihoods are dependent on nature. And in wonky terms, that's ecosystem services or natural capital, but that's a really basic fact that we know, and there have been assessments done on the state of our natural capital assets around the world. What is, has not happened, and that what we work on is trying to get that information into the hands of decision makers so they can actually act on it. And so we end up working on approaches, science and tools that really illuminate where and when does nature help people? Or conversely, if nature wasn't there, it would harm people. And so we have three main pillars to our approach that we use. And as you can imagine, it's a very interdisciplinary group. We have economists, hydrologists, coastal engineers, ecologists, social scientists more broadly. But our three main pillars are to develop this cutting edge science that's really co-developed, so it's a theme here. We, we go and talk with decision makers about what, why, why do you care about natural capital or ecosystem services in the first place, and then what kind of information do you need to change the way you're currently taking decisions. And that co-development process leads to lots of fascinating new science, and we also capture that science in these open source software tools so that the people with whom we develop that approach could then use it after our partnership with them is, is complete. So you'll hear from Chantal soon, and she's been one of our wonderful partners that we worked with very closely for a long time, and now she and her team are carrying forward the approaches that we worked on developed and developed together. So the second pillar of our approach we call just building a body of evidence. So we've done this co-development process with people around the world in asking questions about how does nature protect people from storms or secure their freshwater supplies or reduce flooding risks in 20 different demonstrations around the world. So we have this body of evidence that has been slowly but surely building up. And building that body of evidence takes time, as you heard Rosemary talk about and Jenna talked about on the previous panel. It's the same kind of co-development, lots of iteration back and forth. And then the final pillar of our strategy is then to work to mainstream that. So how do you get those approaches that we've learned in some places to scale and get taken up by other people so we in the university or NGO setting are not the bottlenecks? And that mainstreaming approach we're doing through building capacity through our software, open source tools and trainings, and also engaging leaders. So I'll just use one quick example. So coastal development, pressures from sea level rise and storms is really imperiling more and more people around the world because growth of populations that we've heard about is really pushing towards the coast now. So in, in these models of flood risk and coastal resilience, there were many, many um, engineering firms that had good estimates of flood risk along the coast. None of the, the working models had any information about how do natural habitats, mangroves, coral reefs, wetlands, um, other kind of coastal forests, marshes, how does that ameliorate or reduce the risk of climate change, flooding, storms. So we did that new science working with governments in Belize and along the US coast to incorporate those new habitat effects to what, what, how do they reduce those risks of flooding and storms. So now those tools are open source and can be used anywhere. But it's, those tools are pretty much R&D. Um, you have to be a GIS analyst. Some of our really smart analysts are here in the room. It's not for the faint of heart. So what some people have done now is take those R&D tools that anyone can download from the web and worked with software developers who make really nice user interfaces. So now we have the tool, we call it NatCap or Invest Inside, these really nice, very simple apps that people are using much more broadly around the world to, re to estimate where are people and property and infrastructure most vulnerable to sea level rise and storms, and how can those natural habitats keep bolstering that that resilience that they have or reduce the risk to those, those um, increasing storms and sea level rise. So that's just one example of how the research was driven by decision makers in the governments 
and the private sector, and we figured out some new methodologies, put them into open source tools, and people can use them in a research sense, but now they've been improved even more by somebody else so that government planners with no training at all in research can use them. So we, that's our replication model in places and around the world. That's interesting because yeah. I think the question of scale, how you scale yeah. is really critical mm -hmm. and you've got, a, you've got a theory anyway for that. We're so trying we'll, it, yep. we'll, yeah. We'll come back to that. But, but I do want to go to Chantel Clark-Samuels. You are the director of Belize's Coastal Zone Management um, Authority and Institute. And I think before that you were the Institute's coastal planner. And so you are immersed, I'm sure, every single day in trying to balance the needs of different kinds of stakeholders, uh, the different wants of different communities that require and use the coastal zone. So, you know, tell us a bit about that role and, and how you make decisions and, um, and, and, and how the Natural Capital Project has, has helped with those decisions or not. <laughs> uh, in Belize, we benefit from having a wealth of resources, um, both in our terrestrial environment and our marine environment. And we in Belize, we're cognizant of the wealth that we have. And what has happened over the years, um, the realization of that wealth has driven us to alter our environment, to build up our coastline heavily, and in doing so, degrade our marine ecosystems that support livelihoods and um, or local and national economy. And around 1995, we saw a boom in our tourism industry and a lot of those types of developments that I just described. And so our government realizing that we need to bolster um, national development, but be very mindful that we cannot degrade the very ecosystems that support that. The government of Belize in 1998 passed the Coastal Zone Management Act, which established the institute that I work for to serve as the trusted advisors to government on policy decisions that will help to balance those competing interests. Around the I think it was 2010, we learned of the Natural Capital Project, and that was a very good thing for us because one of our mandates is to develop a national integrated coastal zone management plan for the country, and that was a huge feat because there wasn't enough information available on the, or to, let me put it this way, we didn't have any tools to quantify the values that we know our marine and coastal ecosystems have. And so partnering with the Natural Capital Project helped us to develop our national coastal zone management plan by allowing us to see what those values are, to offer alternate solutions, and to look at the trade-offs if we were to choose one management decision now versus in the future. And I think that's about it. Yeah, that's that's great. What I mean, do you now use the invest tool or the natural capital tools um, as part of your ongoing decision making, or um, how how do you continue using it? I guess is it so, you have the capacity in a sense that the yes. yeah through through our collaboration with the natural capital project, it wasn't um, unidirectional. So while they provided a wealth of technical support, we also have a GIS staff member, and it's slowly growing. We have a GIS technician, so we have a two-person department there. But through the, the our collaboration, we've been able to share our expertise with them, our local knowledge, as well as they were able to leave some of that information with us. So once our formal collaboration ended, um, we, were, we, had the, we have the capacity to run the invest models and to make whatever iterations that we need to make to our um, coastal zone management plan. What are the biggest issues in the coastal, coastal uh, management issues that you're facing? What are the com 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 competing needs, I guess? So I'll give you an example. Um, we have our uh, reef system, we have our mangroves that offer us coastal protection, or mangrove systems and our reef, they also serve as uh, nursery for um, our various fisheries. And um, 
We also have those who are tour operators that run tour, tours on a, a daily basis, and in particularly when we have cruise ship visitor coasts. And so if we have, we want to preserve our marine ecosystems. We want to ensure that the fisheries industry thrive. We want to ensure that we please our tour operators and they can traverse the waters whenever they want. You see where I'm going with yeah, this, yeah. Um, <laughs> where we have multiple users and uses of the coastal and marine resources um, centralized in one location. And so it's how to prioritize certain uses and perhaps recommend that one use be shifted to another area whereby benefits can still be um, gained from local users, but also that we won't be losing functional habitat and functional ecosystems. That's really interesting. Mary, from the, the natural capital's perspective, how, how do you make those kinds of partnerships work? And, and what's the most critical thing to you know, bring in a university-based organization like yours in, into that kind of partnership? There... Yeah, so the, the, I think one of the most important things is what you see right here, which is a, a local leader who is really a champion of, and understands Chantal understands her community, her people, what they need. She ran these incredible community processes along the whole country to engage the local people in each of the key regions. Um, keys meaning C-A-Y-E-S. <laughs> um, and, and understanding what did they want to accomplish for their region. What are these trade-offs among tourism development and local fishing and also just coastal protection from the storms. If you take away the mangroves and the reefs, then the flooding and erosion really is exacerbated. So that's one thing. And then really just having wonderful young people who, uh, there's a group of us sitting here um, and you've seen, I mean, Melissa's like this and the previous, these, the students coming out of the universities are, I think, really the best and the brightest want to do this kind of work. And they have this incredible energy and optimism and coming in and really want to work in applied areas with real people on real problems. So we had a great team of, of young students who came and helped work on this collaboration, and as Chantal described, it was very iterative. It was back and forth, initial meetings, then we went back and worked on the science, and, and Chantal ran a big process to work on community engagement to articulate what did they want from their country's coastal resources, and we just had great communication back and forth. And what we're doing now is trying to ma maintain this, the implementation of plans is always, as you know, the tricky part. And having the NGO partners through WWF in the country and Chantal's connections, we're hoping to make sure that we stay engaged through, through the implementation and even monitoring afterwards. So it's, it's, a, it's a long process, but I think it's, it's key leadership in, in the place and it's really um, you know, young, engaged, smart, people from the universities and then an, an iterative process that's made it work. Great, thank you. Um, I want to come back later and, and ask a question about lessons learned in it because I know the Natural Capital Project has, has done a lot of projects around the world and maybe those are the lessons learned, the young involved in the key leadership, but we'll come back to that. I want to go back to Proposition 1 for a moment here um, because obviously this is a, it's a very important um, uh, piece of legislation that we are uh, we've agreed to do, and it is going to require some, probably require some new policies and some new knowledge, um, some new ways of doing business. And I'm wondering, um, Lester, if you can speak to what um, you think a university like Stanford or others could contribute most at this point and going forward. Sure. Let, let me go to the specifics of that in, in, in a moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll back up the broader context. Uh, probably a lot of people here are not familiar with the California Water Foundation, but uh, the, the purpose of that organization it was, was created almost four years ago now was to move California to sustainable water management. Obviously, based on, on the observation, it's not sustainable the way that we're managing our water resources now. And there's a couple of foundational elements in doing that. One is reframing the debate. If you've been in the water arena, you know the different sides 
they know each other's lines. I mean, they can argue for decades over what the solution is. And so it's so important to reframe what's the issue. And then the other piece of that is forming diverse coalitions, non-traditional coalitions, not just um, the irrigation district and an environmental organization, but get the broader community involved. And, and I, I put out that context because the, the only way you can be effective of reframing the debate and building a diverse coalition is having up-to-date, accurate information, objective information, not information that results from combat science, where I hire somebody to go through the data to support my position. And that's this, this connection to the university is so important to that. And so an upcoming specific example is going to be implementation of the bond. I mean, everybody went hooray when this bond passed by a wide margin because it's the, it's the, you know, the first time in, in recent times that we've had this big down payment on reinvesting in our water system. $2.5 billion can be squandered in a heartbeat. And it really is going to take a lot of vigilance on making sure that the programs are put together right, the criteria is put together right, metrics are set up to evaluate as we start investing this money. And I, I don't mean to say this to de, uh, demean uh, agency people, but it's gonna be important that there's folks on the outside looking at this. And we, for one, will depend on research and knowledge in, in this community to help make sure that the state puts in place uh, effective policies. Now, specifically on, on Prop 1, uh, there's a number of good things about it, but one is it's, it, it invests in a portfolio approach. It doesn't say all we need to do is conservation and our problems will be solved or reclaim water or build storage. It really has a very uh, uh, diversified approach to investment, and that is very good, but it also means there's a lot of moving parts. So uh, a, a couple of examples, there's a lot of money to further wastewater recycling. And uh, in that community, there's a sense that the next big leap in wastewater recycling is going to potable. There's research going on on this campus as we speak on that topic. And you can pick any, any other category, uh, stormwater, capturing stormwater and recharging our groundwater basins. There's research on this campus as we speak on that topic. And so it's gonna be so important to grab the essence of that research as soon as we can and get it in play as they develop the guidelines and policies to start investing those funds. So, Rosemary, I mean, your, your work could potentially provide some of those um, knowledge bases, that the technologies that will allow monitoring and, and measurement of how well we're doing and the things that we set out to do. What, where do you see um, the kind of work that you've been doing going, um, both in terms of the technologies and how you might apply it? I think we do have a number of technologies available that could be used to fill in the measurement and monitoring needs. And I, and I think it's a matter, again, as I said earlier, of forming these strategic partnerships so that you don't expect someone to pick up these journals and figure it out and do it themselves, but form these effective partnerships so that you have universities working with the end users, working with the agencies, working with the water districts, working with the groundwater managers, trying to come up with state of the science solutions. And in a lot of the measurement and monitoring approaches that are currently used to look at assessment of our groundwater resources, I think the problem is state of the practice is nowhere near where state of the science is right now. So we really need to close that state of the science, state of the practice gap. In terms of specifics, one of the things I've become very excited about over the last five years in our research is the use of satellite data. So a uh, PhD student of mine, Jessica Reeves, and collaborating with faculty member Howard Zebker in our department, we have found that there's tremendous information that you can get from data acquired by satellites passing over monthly regions of the state of California, locations all around the world. And the current state of using that satellite data to get information about water levels, you can actually, from satellite data, get information about water levels in aquifers below the surface. It's 
incredibly amazing, but Mary's line, not for the faint of heart, is true when it comes to working with these data. And we have this vision of one day doing something like you've described with your open source tools, creating a user interface where every groundwater manager could have this desktop computer with this dashboard and access satellite data to give them information about the state of their watershed and water levels. So that's kind of out there. But I think a lot of it comes down to how do we close the gap between state of the practice and state of the science? And I think the best way of doing that is through partnerships. And, and that's the sort of thing Stanford and the School of Earth Sciences and the Woods Institute does so well. There's so much support for faculty to say, I'm actually going to stop publishing so much in the refereed journals. I'm going to spend my time out at that field site talking to that water manager, and I'm going to take my state of the science out there to bring up their state of the practice. But it's interesting. So let me ask you a quick question about funding for the kinds of mm. science that you guys are doing. Um, at the same time, we, we, we need to close that gap. But we want to keep pushing ahead on technologies, right? On your satellite-based uh, uh, sensing and on, the, on some of the new, new tools or new knowledge bases that you use in the NAT CAP models. How do, is that getting done? I mean, are we out ahead in, in the science? Um, you're suggesting yes, but how do we keep that going? How do we keep that going? Well, funding is a serious issue. I've <laughs> talked to Pam about this recently. <laughs> uh, funding for environmental research, whether it's from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, just there needs to be the funding for that fundamental foundational science. But as much as anything, what I've discovered in my career is the funding to do those partnerships, you know, to actually support going out into the field. And as Mary said, students love this stuff. Real people, what you say, real people, real problems, I say real world. And uh, students love this stuff, and they are very keen to go out and work and acquire data, but sometimes with the traditional funding models, it's nearly too practical, it's nearly too useful, and this is where places like Stanford and the Woods Institute just can provide the kind of resources the people and the funding needed to help do that type of work that's desperately needed to close that gap. So Melissa is one of those students who is there you go. <laughs> real world, really real engaged people. and really in, and you've you've had um, a lot of experience. I think actually both on the science and the policy side now. Um, and I think you had you were a participant in the uh, Rising Environmental Leaders uh, Program that the Woods Institute presents. How how do you deal at that question of policies versus science, and how do you bring those together in your own? So Rosemary makes an excellent point about this huge gap between the science, where we are, we are, where we are with the science and the political will, essentially. That's mm -hmm. what you're and with water issues, it's really easy to marry the two because um, water is inherently geopolitical and social culturally complex. Everyone's got an opinion about water, and um, you know. What I've realized with my research, you know, I oftentimes put on my scientific cap and ready to collect data and make graphs. And, <laughs> and uh, I realized that it's, it's not so much the, there's not so much a gap in the science that's available to solve these problems, but the political will. And so when I, uh, last year I was involved with, the, with RELP, the Rising Environmental Leaders Program. And it was a really fantastic experience because um, we got to go to DC and learn how things work in Washington. And we got to meet real um, political staff members and see what they're going through. And the thing that really struck me the most is that these people are insanely busy. <laughs> they don't, do not have time to read your peer-reviewed journal <laughs> article. And so I realized that it's my job as a scientist to you know, build the skills to be able to communicate what we know to these people. And um, it's, it's a really, really important thing. And so one of the great things about Woods is that they've really provided a, a space for me to kind of develop these skills. And after RELP, um, I was motivated uh, and inspired to start my own personal blog on a website and start practicing talking about these complex water issues in a digestible format. And then I, I was also really motivated, and uh, I, 
I decided to get act more actively involved in local politics and decision making. And um, I'm on the board of advisors for the Santa Clara Valley Water District, just to get a better idea, like what's going on on the ground. And I just can't believe I didn't do these things earlier. <laughs> it's like, why not? And everybody should. Huh? Yeah, everyone yeah, should. Yeah, yeah. You should all start a blog. And yeah, yeah. Get involved. <laughs> can can we great. clone her? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we should actually. Yes. But so, all right. I'm, I'm going to ask one last question and then open it up. I've taken more time than I expected to, but this is really interesting. So we've talked about the development of some new knowledge bases, some new technologies um, like Rosemary's and also like the models, that, uh, the invest models of the Natural Cap pro Capital Project. Um, and, and so you think on the one hand, we're creating new technologies that are going to be really useful. Is that, is there, what are the barriers to them actually being used? I mean, it, do you need the policies coming on the other end to push them, to enforce them? Do you need to change human behavior <laughs> through those? Um, what do you guys think is the, is, are the real barriers to actually making progress in your, in your areas and to, and to scaling, to taking your ideas and making them happen more broadly? And Mary, I'll start with you on. So we do have, a, the, in addition to the ones I, I mentioned earlier, um, which is this iterative, really listening to what people need. So there's, like, I think we've all said this, there's a lot of science that's not getting into decisions. Right. Some of it is that translation need, but some of it is that the science isn't quite right. And if you start with asking people, what do you need? Sometimes the science is kind of there in theory, but when you actually try to put it into practice, you do need new science that you didn't have before. So realizing that has been really important. But I would say one of the biggest barriers to really scaling it is capacity building. So making sure that people really understand how to use these approaches. So it's very much a co-development approach. We learned more from our Belizean colleagues probably than we taught them, I, I, I say that honestly. But once we have learned together what, what works and what could help them iterate through their thinking of trade-offs in their coastal zone management, how do we make sure that that's a lasting skill set that is there that can be carried forward, like Chantal has said. So we invest a lot in capacity building. And then the final thing is this information that you're talking about, Lester. What we're also really focusing on now is trying to make the, the data and the analytics that we figure out in each of these 20 places and more around the world open and available to everybody so that we save our work and that someone else can start from that point and go forward instead of having to go through the very time consuming steps of getting the data and figuring out the analytics from the beginning so that we can build off of one another. So those are the, the areas that I see as the barriers. But, but in the 20 areas you're working around the world, um, you, you probably are creating win-wins where you've got good good tools and technologies and knowledge bases and really great leaders who want to use them and, and use them at that, at that scale. Does that scale, does it happen faster or better if there's also policies at the federal scale, for example, in the that's countries you're working that encourages the use of yeah, those great ideas? Yeah, that's a great reminder. I didn't answer your policy question. Yeah, absolutely. So this is where I think the one very interesting point about listening to the decision makers and where asking them where are your barriers. Sometimes it's I don't have enough information, but often it's I would love to do that, but I can't. And there's some disincentive or impediment that could be a regulatory change or a policy change. So that's where mostly our NGO partners come in and they really help sort of reduce ah. those barriers by working on legislation advocacy or looking at policy change. So okay. that's very important, absolutely. It's if, interesting, Lester. If I, yeah. if I could add, I mean, I, I, I think that policy is absolutely necessary. A absent the policy change, you might have a good one-off. Right. And you implemented yeah. a project and it's great and everybody writes about it for decades. Yeah. You yeah. need the policy to, to force and then I think, mm -hmm. um, Mary made a good point that sometimes your state-of-the-art knowledge isn't an exact fit to the specific problem and you need to constantly adjust. The other issue that's very important to us is identify your early adopters. I mean, work on the policy, but make sure there are success stories 
right out of the chute. And there, in, in any field, there are early adopters, and they need to be uh, supported and protected because they may be community backlash against them doing what everybody has resisted for a long time. And then and maybe the final plug on that point, I think we have a chance in a bond implementation to identify the early adopters, identify new technologies that's not widespread, and bring those things together because you now have financial incentive to move people. Very good. Rosemary. And I would just say the country of Denmark is a real success story in terms of geophysical imaging. It was in the early 1990s that Denmark said all water districts needed to very completely characterize their groundwater aquifers. And they very quickly realized, well, not quickly, but they realized <laughs> that geophysics was the best way to do that. So that triggered the R&D. As Mary said, a lot of the technologies that were available weren't ideal for groundwater. They'd been developed for oil and gas or minerals. But along came these companies developing these geophysical methods. And Denmark is leading the world in terms of technologies available for geophysical imaging of groundwater aquifers. So again, this it's the early adopter there. <laughs> that came in that you have to do this. There was a need for characterization of the subsurface that only imaging, only imaging could do. But it wouldn't have happened without the, wouldn't have happened without the federal push to do it. Because no. a thing we have run into time and time again is risk aversion mm -hmm. on the part of the decision makers to do something different. Even if this different is potentially so much better than what you're doing, your stakeholders like you to keep doing what you've been doing because of, yeah. All right, we could go on and on yeah. with this conversation, but I do want to open it to your questions. So, yes, sir, go ahead. question is about the dangers to science if the scientists are taking particular positions on policy. I, I completely agree with that. I think our role as scientists is to provide information and that we can illuminate trade-offs, but the decision makers like Chantal and her groups, they're the ones who weigh the social and political consequences of those trade-offs and take the decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, to add to that, um, when we did our planning process and in our daily work, we work with a broad range of stakeholders. And so we would present them with the science. And I, I wanted to say earlier that um, one of the barriers um, that we had before we had collaborated with the Natural Capital Project is finding an effective way to communicate science because science exists, but sometimes it's always difficult and mind boggling. And so having a, a tool to communicate that science helped us in our work because we could present the science, we could get the social and economic feedback from our stakeholders, and then we collectively make decisions rather than uh, using a top-down approach, we try to use a bottom-up approach. Well, that's a really good point. Thank you for making that. Um, yes, sir. There we go, thanks. Okay. Yeah, will, will the bond measure actually help us sort of trade water with Oregon to prevent them from dumping <laughs> all that stuff? Um, the, the chances of us trading water with Oregon, I'd say, were, were slim to none. Um, the, the moving water across state boundaries, I mean, this is where there, there's, there's moments when water looks like an economic commodity, but it isn't. It's a, it's a social, it's got all these social values to it. And we see this with counties in California. Somebody wants to move water across the county boundary, even if it's in the same groundwater basin, and you get this harsh reaction. And um, it, not likely we're gonna see major importation projects. But having said that, California has enough water if we managed it better. And if we knew what was going on underground, if we knew where to store the flood water underground, there's, all these things are, are within our grasp and we need to invest more and we need to have a, a lot more um, open discussion of how we manage our water. Okay. <laughs>
We're hearing a frustration about the way water <laughs> is used, and we all agree. I think we should go back to the back and get a question I there. I hear you. And thanks for the time. My name is Elliot Ryden. I work for the Nature Conservancy, and this is actually for Rosemary. Uh, we would like to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> you can have sure. her. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and also to the student uh, students in the room, uh, we are hiring. And <laughs> really seriously, I'll tell my website. students to get in touch. Um, but this is actually a question related to uh, a new and emerging uh, side of conservation, which is impact investment, conservation impact investments. This uh, concept that that if with uh, with private capital, you can invest in, uh, in and very specifically target returns in sustainable food, uh, uh, fiber production, uh, water, and, and, and actually see out a return on that. And it calls up sort of the, to me this movie that I watched of Patagonia's 180 degrees south and the idea that we can continue to walk down the road we are or if we turn around and take one step forward, we're actually making progress. And, I was just curious to get the panel's thoughts on impact investment, if that's a space that we should be looking. Yeah, interesting question. Anybody want to take that one? Yeah, well, so I think Elliot knows um, the, the Nature Conservancy is doing this, and we've been working with them to support them in lots of areas throughout Latin America, for starters, and now they're going into Africa. And these are so-called water funds that invest in upper watershed areas to secure water for cities and big, often, agriculture and industrial uses downstream. So this was started in the Catskills for the New York City water supply. But impact investing is coming into these areas. So it's not just the local <coughs> municipalities and NGOs and businesses in the lower part of the watershed investing, but now impact investors. The TNC is working very actively in this area to to increase that investment in these funds with the idea that there would be an actual return on the investment, not just um, a triple bottom line, which is nice in some cases, but actually a financial return. So um, I think it's very promising, and I think TNC is going to make it, make it work. Cool. Um, we have time for one more question, and I guess back here. Uh, this will be first for Melissa and then open it to anybody else that wants to comment. Um, we, we have in California uh, serious overpumping of the underground aquifer in the Central Valley. And uh, now we've, well, we have the head of uh, Nestle saying that water is not a right of every citizen, and that's scary. Uh, now Melissa is an advisor to the uh, Santa Clara County Water <laughs> Board, where in an election we saw the founder of Match.com essentially buy a seat on the board. How scared should we be for the you know, influence of money <laughs> on the handling of water issues in California and specifically Santa Clara Valley? Thank you. Okay, so that's a very loaded question. But you can um, answer whatever part of it you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think Santa Clara Valley Water District is, I'd say they're one of the early adopters in California. They're very progressive. Um, it will be very interesting to see what the new dynamic is on the board of directors, and I'll report back to you <laughs> <laughs> once I see that play out. Um, but I think that um, there's a lot of really neat directions that we, or opportunities that we have to move forward with the new groundwater law in Proposition 1. And I, at least I hope with Stanford and our research that we're doing, I hope that we can help better guide um, the administrators and the agencies who are implementing on maybe what, um, what practices might be the best approach in terms of making sure that water is available for every human to drink water, which is not really the case right now in Tulare Basin. So. Okay, one more I, response. I would uh, just add a point. It's only marginally related to the question, but um, <laughs> we're, we're starting to see in, in corporate America that sometimes we think wants to cut corners. I mean, I think that might have been embedded a little bit in that question. They're starting to ask questions about the reliability of their water supply and their supply chains water supply. This is nothing but good. To, to start having Costco, and we've seen this with Driscoll Berries for a long time, start to ask questions about 
what's going on, what are you doing, how are you using your water? And so I think we're, we're starting to see more of that. And so it isn't just the enviros and water managers arguing anymore, it's other people saying, for the good of our economy, for the good of our communities, we need reliable water supplies. That creates an opportunity, I think, to advance science and advance thinking on these issues. Great and wonderful answer. And with that, I think, join me in thanking this wonderful panel.